Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next edition of our Digital Dialogue series. I'm joined by Mark Duncan, Director of Marketing and Business Development at Fraser. Um, firstly, Mark, uh, how are you? Very well, Rory, very well. We have some sun down here in Monaco, and which I, I understand is not quite the same in London, but there we go. I'd be lying to say that we had the same, to be honest. It's grey and overcast, but it's what we've come to expect at this point. So um, we'll just get on with it and do our very best. Um, to dive in at the deep end then, um, the first question that we've been asking quite frequently with this is what are your major frustrations with the market at this point? Well, you know, I, I've heard you I've heard you guys ask this question a lot on these uh, on these webinars. So and I'm going to give an answer, which is probably not. Not the ideal. Answer, but up until about last year, my biggest frustration with uh, the to reach and haven't been able to reach more potential new clients. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you you know that stat out of all the ultra high net worth individuals and high net worth individuals that exist, uh, round about only about ten percent are actually involved in yachting in any capacity. So either as a owner or a charterer. So in theory, that means there's ninety percent left to uh, reach. And even if you even if you d take out people who may be never in interested in yachting because they get seasick or whatever else. Still, a lot of people, mm -hmm. and the reason why I said it's less of a of a frustration today is because, um, you know, in life you can have terrible things happen, but good things come out as a result, and you should always be looking for the good things. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you move forward, and you know, with everything that's happened to all of us over the last uh, year or so, eighteen months or so, with the uh, COVID pandemic, one of the things that I think that that's managed to do is something which we as an industry haven't really managed to do over the last uh, 10 years, which is getting yachting and boating onto the radar mm -hmm. of a huge new market of people that up until then really never considered yachting or boating. Uh, thought, of, And if they did, they thought it was something that uh, it was too complicated to get involved in or too difficult to understand. And I think that's changed. Uh, mm -hmm. That's changed predominantly because last year when people were locked up in their homes uh, for long periods of time, I think everybody realized, you know, we don't want that to happen again. Um, and so what they've done is one of two things, and the numbers, the stats show this. They either purchased property uh, mm -hmm. on the coast or in mountains or in uh, in great areas uh, near the sea, but large, spacious areas where they could be together with family and friends. Or they noticed boating and yachting and got involved there. And the, uh, as you know, Rory, the numbers in our industry are really quite spectacular uh, over the last year. Do you After think the that's been fixed, if you will, or partially fixed by, um, by a situation that was beyond all of our control? Do you think that the growth that the brokerage sector has seen as a result of the pandemic is going to be sustainable and is it going to last? Obviously, we all hope that the scenario we're in currently is, I say short term, it's already been a year, but obviously the, the aim is that COVID will be knocked on the head and will return to normality. Does that mean that the brokerage market is going to return to normality or do you think this will be... This will stimulate growth for the long term as we get more people involved. Well, maybe I'm being naive or optimistic, but um, you know, I think there's a number of factors that, that have all come together in the last year or so, uh, which will mean that, um, in my mind, that you know, yachting and boating will not go back to where it was. It, it will carry on progressing, um, mm -hmm. and. That things like i said before there the, the factor that you know people now realize that you know as people there's been, we've had a lot of clients for example who've been putting off purchasing a yacht for years some of them you mm -hmm. know yeah they will hook up with a broker and go and visit some boats but they never buy um and ultimately they think oh, next year we'll do it next year right because there's too many other things to consider 
Um, in the last year, as you know, about 20 or 30 percent of our clients who purchased yachts uh, were openly sharing with our brokers. You know what? We got to that point where we realized if it's not now, when is it? You know. Mm. And the second factor I think that's come into play is that what COVID also did was really put on the radar for a lot of people. Uh, you know, the state of the planet, whether whether people do or do not agree with global warming, that, that it really exists or not, uh, it's on the radar, you know. Um, and, and I think that um, getting back to nature, uh, trying to spend quality time with family, you know, young kids, get them back to understand what our world is all about. I think that's higher on a lot of people's uh, radar than before. And we see that based on the inquiries we get for charter and for sales. So I think that factor added into the fact that people realize that and we all realize what it's like when you can't mix with your family and friends. And you suddenly realize mm -hmm. that's the big part of life. You know, everything else is a bit worthless if you can't share it. Um, so I think those two factors are will determine and will extend what's happening today. I don't think it's going to stop. It may slow down eventually, but I don't think it's going to stop now. Well, it's it's quite an interesting point you mentioned about the putting things off and deciding that this will the COVID um, element sort of pushed people over the line, and that element of whether or not it will continue. I mean, I know a lot of people that took up hobbies during the pandemic, and now the pubs and restaurants are back open. They're suddenly not in such a rush to spend three hours knitting or drawing in the evening. And it, is there the risk that yachting will fall foul of that as well? I mean, at the idea it seemed like such a great time when you were stuck in the house, but now business is returning to normal and travel is returning to normal. Do you think there will be a significant slowdown? And also, with the amount of business that's been done in the second-hand market, is there going to be a lack of inventory? Is it going to slow down purely by dint of the fact that the best deals have been done? So there's a couple of factors there to, um, to consider, but do you think there'll be issues? Okay, so to unpackage that then, uh, Rory, there's a number of points you rightly bring up in that question. So... First of all, do I think that, um, you know, anybody who's enjoying or experiencing yachting today, do I think that eventually the novelty will wear off, right? Do I think that they're going to go back to life as it was before? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think the answer to that is no. Uh, and that's because the, you know, as we know today, if you look at all the clients who enjoy yachting, whether it's charter or ownership, the, the dropout rate, uh, if you want to call it that, is very, very low. And I think it's somewhere in the region of 10 or 15%. Uh, which is incredible. You know, it's a testament to the industry and it's a testament to yachting itself. So, no, I don't think um, once 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 anybody's experienced the what it's really like to be on board a yacht and what you mm -hmm. can do and what you can see and what you're part of, you know, all of that, the great experience that yachting or boating offers. Um, no, I don't think people would want to go back and will want to go back because there's too much great stuff you can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, clients who... You know, we all have clients who've owned yachts for 20, 30 years, uh, and it's passed down generations. We've got clients who charter two times a year, a year, mm -hmm. you know, and every year something different. They're either going somewhere different or they're doing something different. It's a different dynamic. So do I think there'll be a dropout? Yes, but probably 10 or 15 percent. Sure. And in terms of the infantry, which is a very good point, um, uh, on the pre-owned market, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're already seeing that. Um, we're already seeing that there's, I mean, there's a number of great boats that have been sold over the last uh, year or so, which are no longer on the market. For the moment, it's not too much of an issue because there are a number of owners who are now thinking, okay, now it's a good time to sell. Yep. This is almost a seller's market. Um, and they're either looking to buy new or build uh, or look around for second uh, pre-owned material. But but yeah, infantry could be an issue. If it keeps going at this pace, it mm -hmm. could be an issue maybe in a year or two. Sure. Um, you, we mentioned earlier about um, getting new people into the market, and that's been one of the benefits of it, sort of pushing people over the line, as it were. Do you think that yachting currently is doing enough to create unique experiences? So if we look at the market, it's still very focused on the Med. It's still very focused on the Caribbean. If you're going to charter a vessel, for instance, or you own a charter vessel, you're going to want it primarily in those two locations to recoup as much um, cash as possible. Do you think yachting at this point is as global as it should be? And is that stymieing its ability 
to attract new people and new demographics, do you feel that there's any limitations currently within the Supiot model? Uh, short answer, I think, is no, in the sense that, you know, the industry, I mean, as an industry, we're promoting Antarctica, we're promoting South America and mm -hmm. Asia, and all sorts of great destinations, right? We're, mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of great stuff that as an industry we're promoting. Mm -hmm. uh, as you probably know, um, you know, Fraser uh, and a core team of uh, our, our team uh, it helped open up Costa Rica, which, you know, yep. hopefully is going to happen very 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 soon i mean that's great that's 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 a whole new destination that foreign registered uh, charter vessels cannot well soon will be able to go to that's I mean that's great but but you know at the end of the day rory it's it is supply and demand and yeah you know there's a lot of owners who uh, are maybe not necessarily wanting to put their yachts in certain uh, rather more off the milk run locations um and maybe the demand is not quite there yet for those uh off the milk run locations but you know as far as i'm concerned i mean if you look at you know i mean croatia didn't used to be on the the milk run um uh she got up we, we as an industry promoted croatia a mm -hmm. lot and slowly but surely a whole new clientele started to charter there and spend time there and whatever else so i don't think that's necessarily the fault if you like of the industry per se sure. um i think it's a question of where do people want to go uh, where are they happy to go um, and the owners will place their boats in those areas accordingly, you know. I mean, there is one big restriction, obviously, as an industry, is when you're trying to get to that that 90% that don't do yachting yet, or you're trying to promote new destinations. Once you go outside of the marine sector and you want to start using platforms that are in the mainstream luxury sector, it all becomes rather expensive. Mm -hmm. Sure. And even as an industry, you know, it's a lot of investment uh, into a sector where, you know, not everybody's interested in yachting, and obviously there's a lot of, in inverted commas, wastage. But no, I don't, I don't see that as a restriction of the industry per se. It's a question of um, appealing to the demand and slowly but surely trying to encourage people to go to places like Costa Rica, to go to places like uh, Antarctica or South America or whatever. Absolutely. Um, we, we spoke before this about the, the digital element of the brokerage community's progression, and you spoke uh, in a way that implied it, sh it was something we should have been doing, but the COVID pandemic has sped up that process. Are there any other elements of the industry that you think need to be sped up to help reach new demographics and new groups of buyers? Uh, with the digital element is now well on its way, but are there other areas that we should be um, progressing at a faster rate in your mind from a marketing and business development perspective? Yeah, I mean, the, the the whole digital field, I mean, it, it, it's not really right anymore to say digital because digital is such a wide, huge area that it's not clear what we talk about there. Um, I mean, the whole video, obviously, uh, Rory has been uh, supercharged uh, in the last uh, in the last year. You know, if you think about it, our industry has been, you know, using very very pretty videos of pretty yeah. boats going through the water, pretty music and, you know, pretty shots. Um, for me, that's, you know, that's not real commercial marketing. That's not really getting a message across. And I think, you know, most potential consumers today or clients today, you know, that's not something that's given them what they need. You know, that old adage, if you can't show what the benefit is in about seven seconds, you're probably not going to win Absolutely. that client. But what's been happening in the last uh, year is that companies like our, ourselves and, and many of our colleagues in the industry, you know, we've actually put brokers onto the boats to actually do a, a real video walkthrough, you know, really explain the, the, f the features, the benefits, the unique selling points uh, of that particular vessel uh, and what you can be doing on board that vessel. I mean, that's huge. I mean, you know what many brokers in our industry are like? Um, they're great in front of clients. They're not necessarily prone to be uh, featured on a video. Mm -hmm. So to see some of our brokers and some of our best brokers actually show uh, within a video and actually show what a boat, what the experience on board a boat, particular boat can be, I mean, is a game changer. It's, uh, I don't, when you look at how many people now, I mean, most of us now are placing our, our videos onto, for example, onto YouTube. 
Mm -hmm. Five, six years ago, I, mean, I don't think anybody was doing that, you know. Roll forward to today, and not only are we placing these videos on YouTube, but I mean, we placed about uh, Ace, uh, the Lurson, the uh, 80 meter Lurson. We placed that on YouTube about two or three months ago. You know, it's already on 1.8 million, 1.9 million views. Now, are all of those people going to be buyers for that yacht? Of course not. But is that getting the message out to a lot of new people that maybe aren't uh, weren't aware of yachting before? Hell yes. Mm -hmm. um, we've had some clients recently. Uh, one broker was telling me recently, he came into my office and he said, Mark, don't really know how this happened, but I had a call from somebody I don't know, a potential buyer, who said to the broker, I don't know why, but your boat was pushed to me on my YouTube feed. Um, I watched your video. I thought it's great. <laughs> I'm interested in talking to you about buying the boat. And this was a qualified, very, very real person, you know, yep. who as a result of a YouTube video, I mean, really? A YouTube video uh, called out to a broker and is now having a serious conversation. Do you think there's been a shift in mindset? I think at times the yachting market has thought that using things like YouTube or social media as a sales tool in some way cheapens um, the, the super yacht sort of aura. It's that idea if you if you don't have enough money, you, you don't show the price if you don't have enough money, those, those kinds of things. But those types of technologies and platforms now are so ubiquitous and so used by anyone, especially when you think about the next generations of buyers coming through. Do you think yachting needs to sort of reconsider these platforms and, and where they actually stand in terms of the sort of consumer chain? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I remember, I remember eight years ago, um, you know, uh, we didn't use social media, mm -hmm. you know, eight or nine years ago, because that would have been demeaning. Yeah. But because uh, we we suspected that our clients or anybody linked to our clients were not active on social media. Yep. You know, in this space, in the digital space, things move at, a, at, a, at an incredibly fast pace. You know, and at the end of the day, as an industry, like any industry, you want <clears throat> your primary goal is if you have something that you feel is a benefit to certain types of people, you are responsible to get that message on it in whichever platform and whichever way you feel those people will consume it and be able to at least be aware of it. So yes, I think there was that, but I think the industry today has realized, you know, you can put stuff on YouTube. It doesn't need to be demeaning. I mean, yeah. if the quality of what you're putting on YouTube is pretty abysmal, then yes, you're going to be demeaning you and your industry and everything else. Um, but pr pr provided it's reasonably good quality and you understand the mechanism and how it works if that's where the clients are then it's not demeaning you know and i've just given you a very real example one of many in fact where very real clients and it's not just younger clients it's not just 30 year old people you know this is 50 60 year olds who are active and watching and enjoying content on things like youtube and social media and elsewhere so Yes, I think you're right. I mean, it was regarded as being a little bit demeaning and not quite in keeping with the, the luxury mm -hmm. of uh, the audience industry. But, you know, you only have to look at luxury in any context, you know, whether it's uh, handbags or cars or private jets, it doesn't matter. Um, everyone is uh, using and leveraging these platforms now to the best of their ability because the clients are there. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there any other ways that you think the yachting market needs to change more fundamentally? The, the use of social media is a good example. It's sort of taking the, the industry's ego out of, out of the um, field to a certain extent. And when we talk about the language that's used within yachting, um, it, it's been commented upon in the past that if you're not au fait with yachting itself, then some of the language can be off-putting. If you don't, things like port and starboard, galley, dayhead, even these small kinds of things. Do you think yachting for certain clients will need to change the way it approaches itself? I mean, for some buyers, the nostalgia element of it is going to be very important and they love buying into the, the nautical history and all those sorts of things. It will be blue and white stripes and very sort of um, classic Riviera style yachting. But for maybe more modern clients, 
clients from different countries, do you think there needs to be a shift in, in how we approach them and what language we use? Well, I mean, I think you've hit upon probably the most important thing that every single marketing team and any single industry picked up on and really had to work with during the whole COVID thing, and that is messaging. Yep. Uh, fundamentally important. Um, um, because if your messaging is not on point, it doesn't matter how great your video looks or uh, how great your brand looks. If your messaging doesn't touch in some way your potential uh, client your potential customer then they're not going to engage with you because it doesn't make any sense yeah um so the messaging of our industry is uh, is right in the middle right now is going through a uh, a huge seismic shift um and it's doing so because of many of the things you've just pointed out rory which is that before this industry was very much along was messaging along the lines of uh Oh, look at this great yacht. It was built by this great designer mm -hmm. in this great yard. And look at the lines. Uh, and, and look at this. And look, you know, um, which is um it's not messaging. I mean, that's that's simply take a look at this product. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's specs, isn't it? Which it's specs, you it's can't, glorified specs. Yeah, exactly. you can't you can't translate values from specifications, which is something that the yachting certainly seemed to do in the past. Exactly. And, uh, you know, you know, the old rule in sales, people don't buy products, they buy benefits. Mm -hmm. And the whole messaging uh, that, that the, our industry is going through today is changing the messaging according to who is the potential client. Yeah. Uh, and that messaging changes because, we, you know, if you're uh, if you're working on a promotion for charter, for example, it's all about the experience of being on board. Mm -hmm. It's all about the experience of where you are. So your messaging needs to tap into that. If you're selling, trying to sell something to maybe a 20 meter yacht, 24 meter yacht, that sort of size range, you may well be presenting this and looking to speak to a sector of the market that are brand new to our to our our industry. Mm -hmm. So the messaging that you'll use that type of sales approach for that type of yacht will be very different to the messaging you're using for a boat like Ace 80 meters, which is not really ordinarily going to be purchased by somebody who's brand new to the sector sure and in terms of that messaging i think it ties very closely in with values have we seen the values of buyers and guests change i mean the the, the obvious one is sustainability and we talked about it briefly before how has the market evolved to to tap into that value specifically whether it be through messaging or through the experiences available or through any other means how are we making ourselves seem more approachable to those whose sustainability is important for well i mean that's a I mean, that's a great point i mean before even before covid we'd no, we, we'd noticed this we'd noticed that especially in the charter sector that quite a few or an increasing number let's put it that way an increasing mm -hmm. number of uh, charter charterers when they were working with the charter broker and the charter broker was putting together the selection for them um, quite a few uh, were uh, of the charterers were asking were asking the broker can you make a note um, against any of the boats that you're selecting about what may be slightly sustainable or environmentally friendly or any actions that are happening on board mm -hmm. um, now we saw that before covid uh, roll forward to COVID, and it's increased. Uh, like I say, I mean, everybody remembers those times when, back at the start of COVID, when you had all the TV footage of the, you know, the cities with no pollution and the, yeah. the harbors and all that. So it's really put it back on your on on people's radar. So you know, I think what that's done is that's that's obviously had a major knock on effect, because what that's meant is that I mean, for example. Fraser, I, I, I'm not here to promote Fraser as such, but it's, it's a good example. Fraser was always very, uh, fairly green-minded, but it supercharged our, our efforts, and we set up our own green team mm -hmm. uh, under a, a whole campaign label, the Future Campaign. Fraser unites together to universally respect the environment. Catchy. Yeah, because we suddenly realized that we needed to educate not only the, our own teams around the world, but we needed to start educating owners, especially charter boat owners, because if they weren't thinking about doing something sustainable on their boats that we could then give to our charter retail brokers to present to their clients. Mm -hmm. They miss out on some business unnecessarily so. Sure. 
But aside from being great for the environment, there's also an economic factor there now, which is really, really quite important. Of course, you've got the whole IM, IMO tier three. You've got a whole bunch of stuff coming in uh, over the years to come that are going to affect how owners use their boats, how they build their boats, uh, the quality of their engines, where they go. Um, so w when you're an owner today, the conversations we're increasingly having now is when somebody wants to buy is we're looking five years ahead. As you know, the average owner will sell their boat within a four or five year period ish. Yeah. Right? So we're throwing forward and, and saying to the to these people, look, you know, you want to you want to buy a boat that you know that in five years time, with all the rules and regulations that are coming in around sustainability, environmental respect, all of that, carbon emissions and so forth, that your boat is not going to be disadvantaged to such an extent that your resale price is going to be heavily compromised. Yeah, that's true. Um, um, I suppose my last question then for this is looking at the brokerage market itself. Obviously, Fraser's now under the ownership of Marine Max, um, as is Northrop and Johnson. Um, do you think the future of brokerage is going to see less one-man bands, more structure, larger business environment, um, stronger financial backing, all these things? Because it strikes me that clients are now with all the mishaps that have happened in yachting previously, whether it be with shipyards or brokerage houses or, or whatever it may be, people are looking for stability and security. And do you think that's going to impact the brokerage market as well? Well, I mean, I think it always has. I mean, I, th I mean, if you remember, if you go back to 2008, 2009, 2010, the um, financial stability of uh, brokerage houses was quite important. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have a full service brokerage house. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, again, at Fraser, like many of our colleagues, you know, we don't just have brokerage, uh, buying and selling. We have, you know, huge yacht management divisions, charter management divisions that are, you know, in there for the long run and have to be for a client. And the client expects you to be in there for the long run. So, you know, how, how financially robust you are so you can ride the, the many different waves that, hit our industry uh, is really quite important for any client. Do, do I think, I mean, there was a period of time about five years ago when we did notice there was a lot of um, a lot of investment money hanging around our industry, mm -hmm. a lot of people sniffing around our industry. They invariably spotted the charter sector and thought, oh, there's a great sector to get involved in. We can do something great there. It hasn't totally worked. And that's because, it, as you know, Rory, uh, it takes a long time to understand how this industry functions, the dynamic, sure. and all the different players. Do I think that organically um, there will be some consolidation? Almost certainly. Almost certainly. Mm -hmm. Do I think that there will there always be one-man operations and five-man operations? Yes, because sure. the industry is based on trust. And when you have an owner that really knows and trusts um, an ex-captain or whoever, and then that person goes out on their own. Um, for as long as that trust remains there, that they'll, they'll work with that one-person operation or that two-person operation, even though there's a high risk that obviously if that person gets gets run over by a bus, uh, there's not a whole lot of um, support <laughs> yeah, necessarily. Of you, you, you'll still get that. You mentioned the investment that was sniffing around and how it, it requires a certain amount of time to get used to the nuances of this market. Do you not think that's kind of the market's fault? Is it not our, is it, is the onus not on us and those within the market to make the market seem investable and to help investors understand, explain the nuances, explain these kinds of things? I think the notion that they should have to try and figure it out for themselves over a period of years will always put people off from investing. Do you think there's more that we can do to, to show how the market actually works, where the opportunities are, uh, where the risks are, and data is a massive part of that as well. I mean, I'm sure you and I have talked about it before, with the irritations that we feel from this end with the industries, because the data exists as well. We're just terrible at showing it and actually highlighting to investors where the opportunities are. Um, so do you think the market can do more in that sense? Well, I mean, you know, I think as an industry, uh, we still don't tend to think of ourselves as an industry properly. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yes, we have Libra and, and they've been doing some amazing work. And yes, we have MIBA and EBA uh, and various others that 
you know, in their and in, in to to a great extent are doing some amazing work. But unlike many other industries, we don't have this overarching body, if you will, that uh, is really has representatives with it that are representing the industry as a whole. And, and you sure. know, your dear friend Martin's been talking about this for at least twenty years. So you know, we don't have that. Um, so you know, the industry doesn't think of itself as an industry, and therefore, you know, isn't thinking about in any great way grander schemes or blue skies schemes like how can we present our industry as a eminently investable uh, sector um that doesn't mean to say that people don't think it will be in, in, eminently investable and that they that they won't go ahead and try mm -hmm. and they do i mean you've seen a number of companies in our industry now that are owned by shipping companies um you know that's a that's been an interesting move that actually does make a lot of sense um but, you know, like I say, uh, you know, and when it comes to data, I mean, the data frustrates the heck out of me because, as you say, there's a number of different sources of data. Uh, and, and the way our industry uses some of that data can be slightly cavalier, mm -hmm. uh, at the least. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the short answer is I'm not sure we're at the point where we think uh, of ourselves as an industry in any cohesive way as such. Um, and if you think about it, that you know the industry really is made up of brokerage houses, whether they're full service or simply sales, sales and purchase, and shipyards, uh, and then everybody in between. Um, Libra is the closest to that, um, and its synergies with Seabass uh, are, is quite interesting. But you know, again, no real, no real overarching umbrella body that's moving the industry forward as a whole. Do, do you think um, along those lines, um, there's the issue of data, and I suppose my other issue to ask you about would be rhetoric. Um, occasionally, when the super yacht industry breaks into the mainstream media, I mean, I'll quite often read through the articles and, and be slightly bemused by some of the responses to some quite serious questions from very legitimate um, publications like the Financial Times, or there was, there was some comments in CNN and the rhetoric that the market puts forward at times is not necessarily representative of the health of the market or where we actually are. It seems like if we want to speak to serious investors, for instance, that we need to take ourselves a little bit more seriously when we're talking to um, various publications. Rather than presenting the front that we'd like to present, we need to start being a bit more honest in terms of where we're at. Because I think when we're trying to attract new owners and new clients and stuff, very very intelligent people and they will probably see through what is marketing and and what is rhetoric and what is the truth and what is appealing to them is that something you think is an issue well there's you, you there's an interesting article i you saw it recently uh, on uh, by the bbc mm -hmm. uh, the bbc you know the british broadcasting company you would you, you must be better that they're slightly good and neutral and everything else yeah they, they they had a rather tabloid article that was talking about the uh, the boom in sales in the uh, luxury market, and then they quoted a charity. Mm -hmm. um, bizarrely, I mean, it was a bizarre segue, but they quoted this charity of saying, "This is ridiculous. Uh, all these people who buy these boats, they could have put money into vaccines, right, and uh, and vaccinated the whole planet." But what was incredibly fascinating was when you read the comments that were um, attached to, to those articles on the BBC social media feeds. Mm -hmm. Because about 80 to 90% of the comments were not what we have come to expect, from a, certainly from tabloid coverage. Mm -hmm. The actual comments were not saying, oh, this is ridiculous, you know, all these people who have got all this money doing all of it. No, the comments were saying there's no link between being wealthy um, and uh, and having some sort of responsibility that, to put your money into vaccines if you choose not to. In fact, uh, why shouldn't uh, these people uh, buy yachts and uh, or boats and time with their family and friends? Now, for me, that's it's only one article, but it's one of two or three that we've seen recently where that that sort of tabloid slant, if you will, that you're referring to in the article. Is actually being challenged in the in the in the messaging in the comments of these social media uh, postings, to the point where it's like people are now realizing, and, th and this is encouraging, people now realize that, and are now on board, if you excuse that pun, 
with the notion that, you know, buying a yacht or a boat today doesn't is not necessarily because you want to flaunt your wealth. It's mm-hmm. because you want to get your family together. You want to get back to nature. And, in, and increasingly, with the number of things that boats can do now in, the, in terms of research projects for, you know, finding plastics in the oceans and all lots and lots of things, that it looks like the ground swell of, popula- of uh, opinion is slowly but surely moving away from this notion that big yacht equals bad person. Hmm. I, I read an article recently, and I can't remember which company was quoted in it, um, but it was looking at the fact that Jeff Bezos was building a new million-meter super yacht, and it stimulated a massive run on new contracts for new builds in yachting. Now, if we look into whilst brokerage has done very well over the last year, we know that new build contracts are down. Um, but there was very le- there was a legitimate market source within the article saying that this Bezos project just stimulated a load of growth in the new build market. And if I was a buyer, it wouldn't take me much time to either look at that article and do my own research and find out that that wasn't representative of the truth. So I find it odd sometimes the way that the market tries to present itself, knowing that the actual information is very, um, very public and very um, attainable. Um, so that's what I mean in terms of the market sometimes being a little bit unforthright about where it is. Brokerage is great. New build is slightly down. There's that, and that's not a problem necessarily. No. I mean, there's there's two players in that game, obviously. There's the uh, the person that's providing the quotes, mm-hmm. uh, the person that's providing the information or the the framing of the information. But then there's the journalist. And um, no disrespect, Rory, you're not <laughs> one of these people. But, uh, you know, when it, when you come to mainstream media, uh, they're – so the sad reality is there's, you know, there's a, a narrative that a lot of mainstream media um, feel more comfortable going with, and it doesn't necessarily reflect the truth. Mm-hmm. So they, they don't necessarily, they, they pick up on things wrongly. For example, a um, number of times a brokerage house may be talking about the number of deals that were done. Mm-hmm. Journalists will pick that up as sales, the number of sales that were done. Now, sure. In our industry, the number of deals you do is not necessarily the same number as the number of sales that you do. Because in our industry, if you uh, do an in-house sale, i.e. you represent the buyer and the seller, for a lot of the data points, you count that as two two deals. Not two deals, but two deals. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of ways that our industry is inclined to very subtly use different terminology and then of course a mainstream journalist doesn't understand the subtlety and it transfers into seals but two players in that game and um so yeah very it is frustrating but the other side to it i think is that as you say and this is never more the case than today potential buyers and even charterers are doing a lot of their own research first yeah you know they, they, they 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 want to feel that they are reasonably comfortable before they start speaking to a brokerage house, whether it's charter or sales or new build. Mm-hmm. But you're right. And it doesn't take too long for a PA or, or even the person themselves to do that bit of investigation. Perfect. Well, Mark, thank you very much for taking the time. I, I really appreciate it. I think that's about all we've got time for. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue this over a pint in Monaco or, or one of the other central hubs fairly soon. Um, thanks again. My pleasure. Good luck with the series and look forward to that beer. Lovely. Cheers.